it gives you more to offer and it makes the chef more you know it gives the chef more reason to buy more from you um and almost every chef that's going to buy microgreens is probably going to buy flowers and every every chef that's going to buy flowers is probably going to buy microgreens so they, they complement each other very well um and then you can even do fun things where you start incorporating flower petals into some of your mixes and you add more value that way so now you're kind of taking a basic um there's there's certain techniques like with a marigold if, if if you cut it at the base it'll literally all the flower petals will fall apart and then you can incorporate that into a mix very mm -hmm. easily and marigolds have tons of flower petals per flower and so it's it's a re actually a relatively efficient system welcome to the microgreens mastery podcast i'm your host jonah krothmalnik Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving microgreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's episode, we have Jordan Miranda from Legacy Greens in Tallahassee, Florida, Legacy Greens not only specializes in microgreens, but also edible flowers. This episode is full of gold nuggets from Jordan. Everything from which edible flowers are best to grow indoors, managing pests and disease on edible flowers, an amazing CRM system that completely transformed Legacy Greens' logistical efficiency with chefs, and so much more. Let's get right into it. Hey, Jordan, welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited to have you on today. Hey Jonah, how you doing, man? I'm I'm happy to be here. I'm really looking forward to chatting today. Awesome. Yeah, I think this is this is going to be really great. I'm excited. Um, I'd love to hear kind of how you got first interested in microgreens and edible flowers, and the backstory of how Legacy Greens came to be what it is today. Sure, sure, sure. So we are uh, a COVID baby. We're one of those. Um, we started also in 2020 um, amidst COVID. Um, essentially, we I was. I was working a sales job at the time and I was really not happy with the sales job. And, and I'm a grower at heart. I, you know, my background is in cultivation and I'll share a little bit about that in, in, in a little bit, but, uh, um, but yeah, COVID was going on. We had nothing to do. And, and I had this kind of passion to start my own business, um, being an entrepreneur. Um, I'm a plant lover. I'm the, I'm the farmer for our, our business here. And so we were actually started looking for land. That was kind of how we wanted to start a market farm. Um, and because of a lot of my background experience, I realized, um, I used to work in indoor cultivation and cannabis. And so I'm like, I have all this indoor cultivation experience. Why am I going to go start an outdoor farm where I don't really know a lot? And so I pivoted at that point. I'm like, how can I start an indoor farm? And at the time I knew nothing about microgreens. I had no idea what they were. And, uh, honestly, just searching on YouTube of different ways to start farming indoors using hydroponics. And I actually stumbled upon Donnie Greens of all people and, and saw his operation and his methodology and kind of followed him to the T. And, uh, and we started in, in our guest bedroom of our house. It was a 10 by 10 room, about the size of my office here. And we had four racks. And, um, and essentially during the same time, my brother Daniel was also working a sales job in Utah. Um, he'd recently just started working with this company and COVID happened, so they pretty much told him to stay at home, and he was in a new state, didn't really enjoy being there, and was also looking for something new. And he is a sailor. He is a great salesman. He is. Uh, he can talk to anybody. And so I reached out to him. I was like, hey, man, I'm thinking about starting this little business. You know, I really want to grow this stuff, but I don't really want to sell it. And do you want to partner up and help me sell this stuff? And he's like, you lost me at microgreens, <laughs> but he had no idea what they were either. Um, but he said, Hey, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And so, uh, he moved from Utah back to Tallahassee and lived in, we lived together for a while. And, uh, we started the business in 2020 in July out of our house. And, uh, and that's kind of how we got started. Um, um, yeah, a little bit about my background. Um, so again, I came from the cannabis industry. Um, I used to work in an indoor cultivation facility. Um, I actually managed about a hundred thousand square feet of indoor operation, which was quite a big facility. Um, at a, like 25 years old, I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off. Um, but it was a great learning experience. I, I got to really learn at a really high level and at a really fast pace, uh, kind of what it takes to run large indoor cultivation facilities. 
Um, I really learned about, about hydroponics, HVAC, electrical, plumbing, all the mechanical stuff that goes into building and designing an indoor farm. And, um, and also how to grow plants indoors with the right lighting, the right nutrients, airflow, CO2, um, all of these different factors, pest management, things like that. And, um, and I spent that, I spent about three and a half years working, uh, in the cannabis industry. Um, and then after doing that for so long, I, I kind of was getting burnt out, honestly, because it was a lot of work for someone my age who really didn't have the experience in it. And, um, I decided to kind of step away and, and take some time off. And, uh, and then that's when I transitioned to that sales job I mentioned earlier. And, um, and then that's also kind of around right when I got that job was when COVID started. And, and then that sales job didn't last long and the microgreen business started up shortly after. So that's kind of, that's kind of how we got, got started. Awesome. Yeah. I can imagine the, the cannabis experience must help immensely, especially with the edible flowers portion of your business. Cause that's a lot more complex from my understanding, which we'll definitely get into compared mm-hmm. to the microgreen side of things. Uh, and, and, it, and it must be great to have uh have your brother be able to kind of focus on the sales because he loves that and you love the production side of things. Yeah, that, that sounds um, like a great partnership to yeah. to kind of focus on what you really love rather than, you know, because I, I, I was kind of more in, in kind of in your shoes where I really loved production. Sales wasn't like, you know, back then I didn't really love it. Now it's, mm-hmm. it's you know, it's much more intriguing to me. Um, but like I was in the boat where I had to do both and learn that skill set. And it would have been mm-hmm. lovely if I had a family member or, you know, a, a close friend that I could partner up with and focus on what I loved. And I, I think it would have been um, a very different experience uh, run, running a migraines business that way. But it would have just helped take off the load of having one person do everything. So that's great that you and your brother are able to kind of work together in building the yeah. business. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and that, that, that's really it is, is I, and I had that in mind. I, I knew from the get go that starting a business is a lot of work. And I, and I knew that from my previous, my previous work experience. And, and what I did learn working at truly is that if you can put a good team together, you can get so much more done so much faster. And, and I knew I couldn't do it all myself from the get go. And so I'm like, you know what, you know, I, I called my oldest brother, Daniel, and, and he was willing to join in. Julian was still at the time, my middle brother, Julian, um, who was also now with us. He was at the time still working in a cannabis job and wasn't quite ready to leave that world yet. Um, but he has since joined us now and is kind of f- f- helping us with a lot of our technology, incorporating technology into our business to awesome. make us more efficient. And we can talk more about that um, in a little bit here. But uh, but yeah, it's definitely very much a family affair. Uh, me and my, the brothers own and operate the business. Um and uh and we love it you know it's it's the trick working with family can be tough there's yeah, no doubt about yeah. that but <laughs> the way we managed it was we writ we set very clear boundaries okay the, the growing is jordan the sales is daniel and we do not step on each other's toes you know i respect his decisions on whatever he decides to do from a sales standpoint he respects my decisions on whatever i decide to do from a growing standpoint and, and the same goes with Julian, anything from a technology, IT, customer service. Um, we let Julian make those calls and we back him up all, all, all the way. Awesome. And, um, and so that has really helped us not from going crazy. Um, and then, too, because we're family, you know, we know we can be completely honest, brutally yeah. honest with each other. And then at the end of the day, we're family and we're in this together. And so... Um, you know, there's definitely weeks here and there where it's like, okay, I'm not going to talk to you this week, but next week we'll, we'll squash the beef and, and we'll move on. And so, um, but again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't replace these guys for anything. And I love working with them and, and it's been, it's been a lot of fun getting to do it with my brother. So, so. Yeah, yeah for sure. And I think another benefit that's maybe uh, under expressed with working with, with family is you grew up with them. So you know them better than you would know staff. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like, like a lot of people may not show their full, you know, true colors, like off the bat working somewhere. Yeah. But when you're working with family, like something goes wrong, they're, they're not going to be shy to, you know, bring it up and, and, and work through it. And, and it probably brings you guys closer as family as well, exactly. as well as being better business yeah. people. So, yeah. um, you know, while it can be tough, I think there's a lot of, a lot of benefits for, uh, for that kind of dynamic, which is, yeah. which is great to see that it's working. And it's obviously working well because you guys are, are, uh, are, are uh, expanding, which is something you mentioned um, earlier that we'll get into later on. Mm-hmm. But I, I'd love to kind of hear 
um, where you guys are at now in terms of, so it's been roughly three or well, four years, I guess now, almost yep. four years. Yeah. You've been in business? Get going on our fourth year. Um, yeah. so, so yeah, pretty much the first year in business, we were out of, working out of the house. Um, and then going into our, our second year or end of first year. Yeah. Going into the second year, we were, we had greens all over the house, you know, in the, in the living room, we were harvesting in the guest bedroom, there's plants everywhere. And we're like, okay, it's time to find an actual space. And, uh, we were lucky enough to find a 3000 square foot warehouse in Tallahassee at a very affordable rate per square footage. And it was pretty much a bare bone shell. Um, you know, we did have to go in and, and, and redo some insulation, but other than that, it was a nice open box and, um, and it gave us a starting place. And so what we were not able to afford at that time was building out the entire 3000 square feet. So what we did, and also we were starting to understand construction, permitting, anything we do, we were starting to, that was our first taste of working with these, you know, architects, engineers, things like this and how much they cost. And so we were like, holy cow, what are we going to do with this 3,000 square foot warehouse we just signed a lease for? And so we actually pivoted by building out a shipping container. So we bought a 40 foot shipping container and we parked it inside the warehouse. And so because it was in the building, we did not have to insulate it. And all we really had to do was run some basic electrical and install a window AC unit and a dehumidifier. And we went from four racks in the house to 15 racks in the container. And in the container, we had the harvest area along with all the racks. Um, and also in that container is where I started experimenting with my automated irrigation that we use now and kind of dialing some of those factors. And then kind of moving along the line, down the timeline, uh, that was kind of got us through our second year uh, in the container. And what really happened was we had a nice cold winter in Florida. And so we're like, man, it's like 65 degrees in our warehouse. Let's put up some lights and try growing some flowers in here. And just as something extra, we knew we kind of started hearing about edible flowers. We had some chefs start asking us if we could grow edible flowers for them. And that was kind of our first go at it. Um, and so we just set up one tray with some lights over it in the warehouse with no AC or anything. And through the winter months, we were successfully able to grow a, a pretty wide variety of flowers um, and at least start getting some of our first flower sales through that. And then summer rolled around and it got really hot and everything yeah. died. So we had to take that down. But. Uh, but over that, over the course of that winter and going into that summer, um, our microgreen sales continued to to increase, and we had the the, the funds to start building out the entire 3,000 square foot warehouse. So we bought some HVAC, we bought some more rack systems, and and essentially since then, since we've added the uh, the HVAC to the warehouse, we've completely moved out of the container, and we have about 40 growing racks in our warehouse. Um, the container has been moved out of the building. And so now it's truly, it's just 40 grow racks all on the automated irrigation. We have a, about five racks designated for flowers. And, um, and that's, that's pretty much the whole farm right now. Wow. That, that's yeah. great. Yeah. I've never heard of that uh, use of, of a container inside of a warehouse, but it's actually smart because like to, to, to heat and, or well, in your case, mostly cool, uh, 3000 square feet of non -ins non well insulated industrial space would be quite expensive. Um, yeah. people may not realize how expensive that would actually be. Um, yeah. but yeah, that, that, that's, that's a really smart idea as like a way to secure the space. So you had, so you got mm -hmm. a good, good deal on it because of the, you, you picked the, the right timing. It sounds like to get the space. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm sure if you looked, uh, uh, now for that same space, I'm sure it's significantly more expensive oh, yeah. with what's happened, uh, post COVID with industrial space. So that, that, that was good timing. And then you were able to, to maybe not fully utilize the space the first year or year and a half or so, but you were able to uh, find a way to, to expand from the house and be set up for future success, which is I think really smart way yeah. of, of doing it. If, if you are in a situation where you can get a really good deal on rent, cause I think that's that time uh, at least temporarily has passed, which is, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you're growing about, you have capacity for 800 trays. Is that correct? Based on the 40 racks? Well, so I actually run uh, four shelves because of my irrigation. Um, ah. So I have 16 trays a rack. Um, so it's a little less than 800. 
Yeah. Um, but, um, and, but yeah, so I, because of my automated irrigation, I have tanks under all the racks. And so that kind of eats away at one of the shelf space, which for me as a farmer in, in my setup, you know, those 40 racks was, is still, you know, a very good amount of space and that's keeping us operating just fine. Um, but we are starting to have some conversations with some distributors and some really good conversations. And we're really, you know, some of our future, we have some future expansion plans coming up here very, very soon this year. And we're, we're really excited to be starting to hopefully add on some distributors to our, to our offering and really increase our capacity um, awesome. uh, here, here and later this year. Do you think you're going to stay in the same 3000 square foot or do you think you have to move for, for that expansion phase? No. Yeah. So we, uh, uh, essentially at the beginning of last year, uh, yeah, 2023, we were actually, luckily enough to find a property um, that was, it's just outside of Tallahassee. It is about a 30 minute commute outside of town, but it has this beautiful empty 5,000 square foot warehouse on it. And it's got sitting on, you know, almost 17 acres of land, which is really wow. exciting. And we were, we were in a, in a position to where we could actually secure the property and, and own the property. And so we are, we currently own it now and we've actually had, all last year construction going on um, at that property, getting it ready for us to move in later this year. And so that's, that's a five. Yeah. And so we'll, we should be able to hold um, up to 80 racks of microgreens and I will redesign them to have five, maybe even six shelves. I have some ideas on how to rework my irrigation. Um, and, um, and in addition to those 80 racks, another really exciting thing that we're going to be starting to offer is actually hydroponic lettuce. And so mm -hmm. we're going to get into the lettuce game, growing head lettuce, um, or even maybe some salad mixes. And uh, we have a, a really cool hydroponic system uh, by ZipGrow. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're yeah. a Canadian-based company. Um, so we, we've, uh, we've been, I've been really interested in their system, and we're going to try them out and, and see how they work for, for producing some lettuce for us. Wow, that's amazing! Yeah, congratulations. First of all, that's that's amazing to thank you. Like, be able to to purchase the land and the space because not only the you have the five thousand square feet which will hold you over. It sounds like maybe not for that long based on your mm -hmm. on your growth trajectory, but you have the land so you can always build more indoor exactly. space on that land, exactly. which is, which is huge. That that was one of the the challenges of of you know from my farm being in the city is one you're paying much higher rent. Uh, and, and then you're not building the actual asset of the, the, the building structure itself at a land, which will always go up, generally speaking, over time. And right. you have the capacity to expand. So you guys have been, it seems like you're making really smart business decisions on, on how you're operating the business, which is just phenomenal here. It's, it's great to see this uh, and, and hear this. Um, and I'm excited to see when, when you guys move into the, to the new facility. I think that'll be really Absolutely. cool. It, I'm guessing there's much more technology in that, in that uh, building that we have right now would be my guess. Well, it's, it's just better designed, better insulated, better, more thought through. Um, again, we're, we're definitely still balling on a budget, if you will. It's definitely kind of very lean. It's not the prettiest looking facility, but it'll get the job done and it's functional. Yeah. Um, and that's really our concern right now is, is, is trying to reduce our expenses. And so getting out of this warehouse and getting into somewhere that we know will work and it won't, you know, it won't cost us too much. And, um, and actually part of, part of how we've been able to fund the construction of it is it, we, we went through the very long process of acquiring a, a USDA farm loan, um, to actually help fund the project. Um, and so that was another huge milestone for us to secure that funding and, and give us very favorable, um, terms and to, to essentially get that build out pretty quickly. Um, yeah. and, and that was another, and, and kudos to my brother, Daniel, for that was a eight month application process oh, wow. with delays and paperwork out the you know going you know going crazy and uh but we we got everything filled out and we went through it all and and uh they're like man microgreens we i wish we worked we, we were apparently their first microgreen farm uh to acquire usda funding um first indoor farm so that was pretty exciting huh. for the usda side and uh, they're just as interested to see the farm when it's all said and done as as we are so so that's cool that's awesome. Yeah, no, that's great. I think that that's good because you're paving a way for the next uh, generation of farmers to be able to get access to those type of things. So, um, yeah, like I, I mentioned this often, like, like 
in especially in the U.S. and Canada, I'm not sure about other countries, but there's especially in the U.S. There's lots of grants available for equipment for expansion for farms. There's a lot of support for farmers. I don't. What my, my way of thinking about it is, I don't recommend relying on these type of things, but to utilize them to be able to expand faster or to, you know, to be able to buy a piece of technology that maybe you wouldn't have bought because it would have been too expensive that you can now access. So um, mm -hmm. relying on it's not always the best idea because you never know what's going to happen in the future with mm -hmm. that sort of stuff, but you can utilize it now to expand faster or get to wherever your goals are faster. So yeah. I think a lot of farms, whether you're small or big, um, you know, you should be looking into into USDA or state kind of grants or provincial if you're in Canada. Um, it's yeah. a huge, huge benefit for farmers that I think with migraines in particular, a lot of people just don't know about it because they're kind of disconnected from the typical, you know, type of farmer, a field farmer. So they don't mm -hmm. have the same access to information that those type yeah. of farmers may have. Yeah, no, we're just as much farmers as they are, you know, yeah. we're growing a crop and it's actually a very, it's a very legitimate crop and there's a, there's a very solid business plan and model here. And, and, uh, and again, from what the, you know, when we went through that application process, they were actually very impressed by the figures that we were able to present a very yeah. conservative figures. They're like, wow, if you guys can do that on, and, and because of the cash flow of, of how our microgreen business operates, we're consistently turning out product. You know, most outdoor farms have one big harvest a year. And they're relying on that harvest to pay all their bills for the entire year. And depending on weather and whatever factors, it can it can cause influence. So migraine farmers are very favorable businesses to funding um, in, in that sense. So so by all means, if you're a farmer looking for funding, there are resources out there. And actually, that's what my my middle brother Julian has been starting to focus some of his time on as well is looking into these grants. Um, you know, making relationships with with. There's actually and I, I wish I could remember the name, but there's our, there are, there's a, a, a group that will help you write grants and then they only get paid if the grant, if they win the grant. Yeah. So they essentially get a commission for writing the grant. Um, and these guys do this. And so that's, it's, there's a good chance that they will win the, the grant. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I've, I've utilized those type of things for, for other, other sort of programs, not necessarily for, for grants, but scientific research sort of thing. So, sure. um, yeah, no, like those companies are, are great because they're experts in writing grants and mm -hmm. I, I've, I've written grants before and, and, or applied for, for grants and you're, you're just kind of guessing, like you're hoping yeah. that you're writing the right things yeah, and exactly. saying in the right way. So it, it, for, for taking a percentage, it's well worth it. It's a great service. I don't know of any specific companies that I would like recommend for that, but if you just search like grant, uh, like, like help with writing grants or whatever, you'll mm -hmm. find them tons of companies and just search for one that's specific for agriculture would be right. uh, more beneficial for sure. Yeah. Um, but it sounds, I could talk to you forever about, uh, about the expansion and, and, mm -hmm. um, but I'd love to hear what, kind of where you're at now with, with, uh, who you sell your products to, um, sure. what the breakdown of, you know, consumer retail restaurants, uh, distributor mm -hmm. is in, in, in your current state of operating. So we're predominantly restaurant focused. Um, we have, I think literally two, two bigger and one small retail customers. So grocery stores or people who resell our product. Um, and then pretty much everybody else is, is restaurants. Um, we have a couple of, of home delivery people who happen to buy like, you know, four or five, eight ounce boxes a week. So we're like, okay, we'll deliver that. Yeah. And, um, um, but predominantly restaurants and, and we started off, uh, again, when we started the business doing a lot of farmers markets and that's kind of how we got our name out there. And, you know, again, during COVID, a lot of the restaurants were still closed. Um, but again, being in Florida, things started to open up pretty quickly. And as soon as we noticed that, you know, we instantly were like, Hey, these places are opening up and their people are wanting to go out. And, and we saw the desire for people to want to eat out. And, and we also noticed how chefs more than ever were wanting fresh local product. And so we jumped on that. And Daniel really focused on going to as many restaurants in Tallahassee as he could. And, and within that first, when, it, when we were in the container, we were pretty much able to secure and fill up that container to capacity with restaurant accounts. Yeah. And, um, and so that very quickly, um, you know, gave us a steady cash flow um, every month to month. We were really like, okay, wow, this is the money's coming in and we're paying all of our bills. That's really exciting. Um, and, and that's essentially and, and really just this year, we've started some discussions with some local distributors 
Um, we are in the process. Once we get moved to our new facility later this year, we do want to become GAP certified so that we can start working with even more distributors. But the ones that we're working with now um, haven't had any requirements as far as food safety certifications. Um, and so we're, we've gave them, we've actually given them a couple of free deliveries. So about two or three free deliveries of about 20 units. And they've been giving them out to their sales teams and testing them out and hanging on to them. And, um, and we got our first one to place their first standing order of about 20 units. Um, and so that was, that's really exciting. And we have another one that we're, um, hopefully going to be get starting to do some business with too. And they're looking to get almost 50 units a week. So it's, it's, it's really fast. Like, wow, distributors are pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's, you know, right now that's, that was, you know, one of, one of our biz, biggest expenses is, is we do have a good, you know, we, at the time during our busy season, we do have a good bit of staff, um, mostly to get the deliveries done and also manage the workload of the harvesting. Um, and, and it just resulted in pretty high overhead. Our expenses were really creeping up on us. And, um, and then now, now is the slow time or at least December, January is the slow time for us during the holidays. And that kind of really hurt when the restaurants closed and we still had a, a good bit of staff. We're like, Hey guys, yeah. we're going to unfortunately need to reduce our hours a bit and, and kind of get through the slow season here. Um, and for the most part, I mean, we're working with a lot of college kids, so they're pretty flexible as it is, but, um, um, but I would love to be able to maintain that, that, that steady workflow throughout the year. And so we're hoping that the distributors can kind of start filling some of those gaps for us, um, during our slow times. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah no, it, it, it's one thing that, that people that, um, are looking for farm jobs don't realize the benefit of microgreens is there actually is, while there is lulls sometimes and like peaks and, and, and troughs of demand, you're producing year round. Whereas, you mm -hmm. know, most farms just outdoor farms are, have, have some sort of season where they stop production, even mm -hmm. in generally in warmer climates to, um, you know, like in the summer months, it, it's a lot harder to grow produce. I'm guessing where yep. you guys are, cause it's just so hot. Yeah, it's so hot. So, yeah. You know, so there, even, even in warmer climates, there's always peaks and troughs. Uh, so that's, that, that's pretty normal. And it's something that, um, I always ex like try to express to staff. It's like, this is about as good of a farming job as, as you can find. Uh, you don't have to be in the heat. You're in like an air conditioning space. Everything's mm -hmm. ergonomic. Uh, it, it really is as, as a, someone who, um, wanted to create good quality farm jobs like that microgreens is is definitely one way to do that because it's so comfortable in the working mm -hmm. environment um but yeah no that that that's 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 great that yeah the distributors i think are a great model as you scale uh because mm -hmm. like to sell to 200 restaurants when you can sell to three four distributors the logistical work collecting payments deliveries it just while you take maybe yeah. a lower percentage of, of profit, you can re like it allows you to scale production because more yeah. of your time can be spent on that rather than dealing with uh, customer issues, payments, all that kind of stuff. Right. I mean, we were, we were literally debating on whether or not to buy a second van just to get the deliveries done efficiently and, and quickly. And um, and now we're like, well, wait a minute. These distributors are saying they'll either come to us or we only yeah. got to do one stop to them. And, you know, and then we're just essentially promoting that, those distributors to all of our restaurant customers in those areas. And so, you know, our, our newest territory where one of these distributors is based out of is Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, Jacksonville is a very sprawled and spread out city. And, and for, for one person to try to do even 10 deliveries would probably take an eight hour day, you know, and then you still got to drive back to Tallahassee. And yeah. so we're, we're our approach for Jacksonville is let's, let's get in with the distributor. Let's promote our, our, our greens to, through the distributor to our chefs. And, and, and that'll be the approach for Jacksonville. Uh, yeah, but yeah, the, the, the driving is, is, is just a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the great thing with distributors is like, they're literally doing that distribution for you. So you can expect, like, you can really expand beyond your local area. Cause mm -hmm. some distrib like, like, you know, U.S. Foods is, is not a great example because they're nationwide. But as an example, like if you get into a larger distributor that's like South Florida regional or North Florida regional or something, then they can deliver to all these small towns, all these restaurants that you would never be able to deliver to because they're like two hours right. away or three right. hours away. So it just it gives you so much more opportunity to expand your market. Um, right. 
but you really have to be at the kind of the position that you're in where you have enough capacity to actually produce. Cause like, you know, you don't, you, you don't want to damage the relationship with the distributor and be like, Hey, we can only produce a hundred units a week and that's it for the next like two years. It's mm -hmm. they're not, they're, they'll probably go find someone else real estate, unless right. it's a really small distributor. So you guys are in like a great position to work with those distributors, which is just, yeah. it's, it's great to, to see um, how fast you guys are able to, to make this happen. It's just, it, it's really nice to see. Yeah, um, yeah. In terms of uh, edible flowers, what percentage of your business would you say right now is edible flowers versus microgreens? So it's it's shifted over the years for a couple of reasons. Mostly, so we used to grow a lot more flowers um, when we were still in the container and we were starting to expand into the warehouse. I had way more flower capacity and space. Um, and then what, what happened was Daniel was doing such a go good job selling the microgreens that the microgreens actually outcompeted the flowers. And so, and because it's a, you know, we kind of had to, to decide, um, the microgreens are just a, a simpler and more, it's a, it's an easier process. It's a much simpler process. It's easy to scale. The flowers are more labor intensive. They do require more know-how, more management. And so we made the decision to folk, you know, to to give the space to the microgreens and, and reduce the flowers. Um, and so now our flower sales are not nearly as much as they used to be a year ago, um, but they're still, you know, I would say about a thousand dollars a week um, of what we're doing. And, we, and that's only really using, I think, about three or four grow racks. Um, so I have one that's basically a nursery rack for up and coming flowers. And then the other three are production racks, which are constantly in flower. Um, and, uh, and yeah, about we're right now we're able to do about a thousand dollars a week, just in flower sales. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, uh, when, when you're comparing the two, it, it's, it's, it could be quite difficult because there's, there's nothing like microgreens. Like they, they'll never, I don't know if they're ever, maybe there will be a, some new crop somehow. I don't know, but yeah, like it's, it's hard to compete. Cause like, if you can expand the business with microgreens, you have more capital to expand faster and to get more of the good product out there. Mm -hmm. Um, but edible flowers are, they, they really fascinate me because there's so many growers growing them now and the market is really shifting. Uh, not like microgreens are growing in and of itself, but I see more restaurants also using microgreens and edible flowers. So it, yeah. it's, it's interesting to see that that market independent of microgreens is growing on its own. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you noticed any specific varieties that are most in demand in, in the edible flower space? Um, not necessarily that are more in demand. I guess what I would say is that the chefs, what, what I have learned from growing the flowers over the years, the chefs like some variety. Um, so we used to try to sell like single color, single variety boxes uh, and, and just fill those boxes with one variety of flower and then try to market all these different colors of flowers and varieties. And that ended up being a pain in the butt. And so we're like, look, we're just going to sell a mixed box. It doesn't matter who you are, what you buy. You're going to get a mixed box of whatever flowers we're growing at the time. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a combination of whatever colors that we have at the time and whatever sizes and shapes we have. Um, right now, we predominantly only grow pansies, violas, and some marigolds. Um, however, when I used to have a lot more space, we were growing bachelor buttons, dianthus, borage, nasturtium, um, these ones called balloon flowers, buzz buttons, um, a whole variety of, of flowers, and the chefs love them. And, uh, and I will say with the flower, the flowers are, are definitely, if you're, it's a balance, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's really a balance, but if you're a smaller farmer and you're really looking to add value to your offering and, and create a, a, an easy way to increase your cash flow pretty quickly, um, and have a product that is producing consistently. Cause once you get flowers growing properly, they will produce a lot of flowers if you manage them well. And so I think do, starting them off at a small scale is, is a great idea. It really gives you a, a broader offering. It helps you increase your invoice price, your average invoice number. Um, but I will say that when you start to scale them, you are going to run into another set of issues. And again, just managing more flowers does become more complicated. Um, and, and just the labor associated with harvesting the flowers. There's just, I haven't figured out a good way to harvest thousands of flowers over the course of a couple of hours. Um, you know, right now we hand cut one by one, every single flower and we package them all by hand. And so that is really the part of it that has become challenging as we've grown. It's like, man, we're spending almost more time harvesting flowers than we are cutting the microgreens. And how can we do this more quickly? 
Um, um, and, and, and do we want to continue to do this as we grow the business? Because is it sustainable? Is it manageable? And um, and really, the flowers is almost its own business. You know, it can literally be you can literally just be an edible flower grower and have a, a totally legitimate business. Um, but just know that there are there is some more know how that goes into it. And you do need to be a little bit more on top of, you know, your 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 replacement plants and your schedules um, to avoid issues and, and potential of contaminating the rest of your farm. Um, and so that's what I was, that's my two cents as from my experience growing flowers so far, I love them. I love growing them. I think they're absolutely beautiful. I love offering them to the chefs. I love when I go out to one of my restaurants, I order a cocktail. There's a beautiful flower on it. It's, it's one of my favorite things, but I will say they do have their own set of challenges and, um, you do want to be somewhat disciplined and, and have a good game plan if you're going to get into the flower game, uh, yeah, but they yeah. are, they are, they are attainable. Yeah, that, I think that's that's really really good advice. Yeah, that that was the biggest. That, that was what I was kind of curious about is like how you guys are making it work financially as you scaled it up. But it sounds like you realized that the late. The, it sounds like labor is probably the biggest challenge because of you know I can't until the Tesla robot comes out. I don't know how you automate something yeah. like that. You know, it's like so perso- like it needs you need some something that is robotic pretty much to. Mm-hmm. to to pick them without damaging the plants. Right. Uh, so yeah, it, it, that, that's the biggest challenge. Now, one, one way that might be more attainable for some people in but s- specific climates is if they're able to grow them in a greenhouse that saves on some of the costs, like the lighting that you're, because mm-hmm. you're running the lights, like with my greens, you sell a tray, you're running the lights for, I don't know, seven to maybe 20 days on the longest crop sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but with edible flowers, they're constantly running to, to keep them going. So the electricity costs and, and the, the, the rent space, if, if you know, you're in a city and you're, you have limited space, mm-hmm. you can't produce as much product. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. like as an example, if you're starting out, you can do roughly, depending on the, if you start with the, the, the most profitable crops, you can do roughly $2,000 a month per rack. And then as you scale, it obviously gets less as you're getting different customers, restaurants and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but with, with uh, edible flowers, you may maybe to be half or even less of the potential revenue potential. But um, the good thing with edible flowers though, is like I use certain microgreens as almost, I don't want to say a loss leader, but as a way to attract customers. So edible flowers mm-hmm. can't be a way to distinguish yourself from the other micro growers that are just doing microgreens. Cause like, you know, if I was a chef, I would look at someone offering edible flowers and be like, wow, like I can't get this anywhere else. They look exactly. beautiful, you know, like I want to go with this guy. So it, there, there is other type of non necessarily monetary advantages of having yeah. some edible flowers in your lineup. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's exactly, is it, is it really, it, it gives you more to offer and it makes the chef more, you know, it gives the chef more reason to buy more from you. Um, and almost every chef that's going to buy microgreens is probably going to buy flowers. And every, every chef that's going to buy flowers is probably going to buy microgreens. So they, they complement each other very well. Um, and then you can even do fun things where you start incorporating flower petals into some of your mixes and you add more value that way. So now you're kind of taking a basic, um, there's, there's certain techniques like with a marigold, if, if, if you cut it at the base, it'll literally all the flower petals will fall apart. And then you can incorporate that into a mix very easily. Mm -hmm. And marigolds have tons of flower petals per flower. And so it's, it's a actually a relatively efficient system. Um, to incorporate some color into your microgreens. Um, and the biggest thing is that everyone buying, any chef buying distribu- uh, uh, edible flowers are coming from a distributor and they are terrible. Um, yeah. They all look bad. They don't last. And so if you come in with a box of really beautifully, freshly harvested flowers that are lasting 10, 10 days for them, um, they're going to be like, holy crap, Like I want to buy these. Um, and so, um, it's definitely a value add and it, it's a, it's a, it, it's, it helps you stand apart from the others. Um, and again, if, if, you know, we, what we're, we're, we're starting to do actually to help people get into it. Cause it's, it's actually not a, a complicated process. It just requires some discipline. Yeah. Um, but we, we actually offering an edible flower consulting program. Um, I have written SOPs on exactly how we grow and manage our edible flowers here at legacy greens. Um, I'm even working on an IPM protocol for my SOPs that I will be coming out with soon. Um, but, uh, but essentially the way I, I organize the consulting is you get three months of access to me and we'll start off by walking through the SOPs, whatever materials you need. And then I will be there every step of the way as you plant your first seeds, 
take them through the growing process and start harvesting your first flowers. And um, that's kind of how I like to offer consulting is I don't like to have a call and then leave you to figure it out for yourself. I kind of like to walk you through the process and answer any questions you have along the way. And that's something that we're offering if, if anybody's ever interested in learning about that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we'll put that in in the show notes. Uh, we'll put a link to that. You yeah, know, that that's great. Sure. Yeah, because they're I, you're the first person I've heard of that's doing edible flower consulting, and I think um, that you know it's it's needed because you know, it, for example, if I were to start growing edible flowers, there would be a big learning curve because you know I have no expertise on edible flowers. I haven't gone mm-hmm. through the process that you have. So, um, for anyone that's interested in in uh, checking that out, definitely definitely reach out to Jordan. I think that's that's a great resource to um, yeah. have someone that's done it, experienced it, knows what works and doesn't work. And just get all that information right off the bat is 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 the way I wish I was able to start my business ten yeah. years ago. Um, so that, that that's great. Um, now talking about pests and disease, um, what I've experienced with uh, you know other growers growing edible flowers, whether it's in a greenhouse that I've seen years ago or more recently in, in indoor facilities, is there's much higher risk of obviously having especially pests, but disease as well in edible flowers in even if it's indoors um just because of how long the crop cycle is so so what would you say are the most common pests you've experienced or disease and what are the you know bare bones basics without getting without giving away the secret sauce uh you know how how people can best manage it so the as far as the the common pests and diseases so disease wise i think and this is probably more common than, than the pests would be powdery mildew all right, so powdery mildew PM um, is a fungal disease, and essentially it comes up when you have a lot of leaf-on-leaf contact, um, areas where with reduced airflow, um, and anywhere you have a really condensed area of plants, and you're also incorporating water um, into this system. And so the flower beds are just that. They are a bed of flowers. They are densely packed. Um, and even even when you have fans blowing directly at them, the canopies do get so thick that there will not be any airflow penetrating through that canopy. And um, so PM is, is by far one of the bigger diseases you want to be on the, uh, on the lookout for. And just regard, I mean, as far as the disease itself, it's not the end of the world if you have it. I mean, if you're growing long other long-term crops like baby greens or lettuce or anything else in the same area, you do want to be very cautious with powdery mildew because you don't want it to transfer to those crops. But if you just have microgreens in your farm, the likelihood of that PM growing and spreading on a tray before you harvest it is pretty low. Um, and because everything, you know, everything else in the farm is turning over so quickly, the chances of getting powdery mildew on a microgreen tray is, is pretty low. And I've never had it happen in, in my time. And I've had some pretty bad PM on flowers and it never affected my microgreens. Um, the next most common pests are going to be spider mites and root aphids. Um, spider mites are definitely a pain in the butt, um, and I've dealt with them before. Um, and root aphids are by far the worst thing. Um, and I'm also actually currently dealing with them right now. Um, so we can talk a little bit about that. But um, our method, and, and this is something that we've always tried to do in our farm, is I, I don't use any chemicals. I don't spray any pesticides. Um, I don't do anything like that. And so... Our approach to managing pests on the flowers has always simply been remove them from the building and start fresh. And um, it can be a difficult way to manage it. And if, if you're not on top of your scouting and you're inspecting, it can come around and really bite you in the butt because if you do find them and you find that you have a serious issue, that will completely stop your flower production, which could really hurt your cash flow. Um, and so one of the things we do or, and one of the ways I manage them is, is – is, I have incorporated a very strict uh, rotation. So just like a microgreen tray, um, I treat my flowers almost like a, just a longer microgreen tray. Um, they do have a longer grow time, um, but they're very structured. And even if the flowers are still producing like crazy, I will completely rip those beds out and replace them with new fresh flowers. And, and the sole reason for that is just to avoid pests, um, avoid powdery mildew, um, and and really the key to 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 re- avoiding pests in your farm is having that plant rotation constantly going and then also contamination you want to think about your farm as sort of like pretend you're a bug how can the bug get into your building like literally what doors can it fly through or what crevices can it crawl through and that's one of the things too that i talk about when i'm consulting with a lot of my edible flower 
uh, people is that how well do you think you can contain your farm? Um, do you have one door, you know, before entry? Is there two doors before entry? Do you have a double entry? Um, do you have foot baths to keep your shoes clean? How often are you cleaning your area? Are you even able to sweep and mop in your in your farm? Um, and um, different things like that. And so that's how, you know, really cleanliness and contamination is the first thing I always talk about when if you're even going to talk about flowers. You know, before you even get into them, can you control what's coming in and out of your farm? And if you can, then you have a pretty good chance of growing flowers successfully and, and reducing your chance of pests. Um, and then when you do find them with regular scouting, you immediately want to pull them out, get them out of the building completely. Um, and if you can, if you're having to replace an entire rack, you want to wipe that rack from top to bottom and, and essentially clean and reset it and put fresh plants in. Um, you know, another thing, if you're doing edible flowers or any long-term crop in an indoor farm, you should never bring outside plants into your farm. Um, I don't care if you grew them outside in your house or where you bought them from, you know, even if it's a harvested plant or whatever, uh, even bouquets of flowers from the grocery store that, you know, people, I'd never bring any outside plants into the farm because that is usually where you're going to be bringing in other pests into the farm. Um, I always also instruct my crew to come to work with clean clothes on. Um, don't go out in the garden in the morning to check on your plants and then come to work. You, you know, try to do that, you know, at another time. Um, and, you know, we have foot bats coming in and out of the building. Uh, the crew knows to wash their hands whenever they get started touching the plants. Um, they wear hair nets to keep anything in hair from flying out. Um, but really it's about containment, um, in, in terms of pest management, keeping your farm contained, keeping it clean. And, and that's really the key to avoiding pests. Um, and as far as managing them, when you do have them, um, my only real way of doing it without using chemicals is simply to remove them, uh, take them out of the building and start fresh. And so, you know, uh, you always want to have a plan for when you do find them, you know, as far as what do I need to communicate to my customers? Is this how significantly is going this going to impact my flower production? And uh, is it at a contamination point to where I can maybe keep them for another week or two so I can give, you know, get through the next two weeks and give some notice before I completely destroy them and, and pull them out of the farm? Um, and so that's that's kind of IPM for flowers. Yeah, no. And, and, and having that experience in, in the cannabis industry, I can imagine help with that. Yeah. Cause like all, all that, all that stuff is, is stuff that I know of for like, as example, greenhouses, greenhouse production, mm -hmm. like that stuff is, is all like foot baths and, um, you know, scouting. And, and these are, these are things that you don't have to worry about with micro greens, but right. I, I did implement a bunch of those things, um, at, at living earth because, you know, for example, yeah, for, like, I, people would want to bring house plants or people would even bring like plant starts for their garden to like give to another staff. And I'm like, these got to go outside. They cannot be yeah. inside because it, all it takes is like, you know, and with microgreens, there's much less risk, but all it can take is a fungus, one fungus gnat to come off mm -hmm. that plant, go in the farm. And then all of a sudden you have fungus gnats yeah. or yeah. spider mites or aphids yeah. or whatever, whatever it is. Yep. Um, and then even worse is disease. You can't, you can't even tell sometimes that it has at the beginning um, like, you know, powdery mildew, you can literally touch a leaf with it and then outside and then literally bring it in or bring, bring it in on your shoes or whatever. So it, it's almost like, like COVID where it's like invisible, you can't see it, but it's there. Yeah. Um, so yeah. to prevent that's, uh, really, really important. So that's all really great advice for, for anyone getting started. Have you ever tried, um, using like when it gets to the point where it's not bad, uh, with any sort of pest or, or yeah, I guess pests in particular. Have you ever tried uh, introducing beneficial insects for for different things? Have you found that that wasn't effective or or it's not really the right so I for edible flowers? Yeah, so I haven't um, I haven't used them yet, and I, I am familiar with them. I've used them in my past experience and, and working in cannabis a lot. Um, and now that that is actually one of the approaches we're going to be doing. We're going to be introducing some ladybugs into our farm to help with the aphids, um, and essentially where the where the contamination is at is we've only found a couple spots um, on a few flowers where we found them and we've already removed those flowers. Um, and so essentially probably for the next six months, or at least until we, we move out of this specific facility, 
uh, I will continue to have Ladybugs on order, probably releasing at least once a month, if not bi-weekly, um, to maintain a population in the farm and to continually beat back root aphids. Um, root aphids, if you any new farmer, are, are, are your worst enemy. Um, and what you need to know about them is they reproduce asexually and they go through their life cycle in about two or three days. And they also do form a flying stage. So when their population gets dense, they will actually go to a stage of life where they grow wings. They'll look just like a fungus gnat. They'll fly to another section of the farm and they'll repopulate. And yeah. so they're very hard to manage. They're very hard to find. And um, but ladybugs love to eat them. And so um, I, I do plan on this will be the first time I introduce uh, a, a predatory bug in my farm. Um, I haven't had to do it in the past, um, but this will be the first time. And so um, I'll let you know how it goes. Um, what I have learned from doing it in the past um, is that at least with some of the HVAC equipment, they can sometimes get sucked up into the HVAC equipment. And so they don't quite tend to last as long as like maybe they would in a greenhouse setting. Mm. Um, and um, but as long as you're providing uh, as long as they have plenty of space to hide from the intense lights and moisture to drink and pests to eat, they will stay in the area and continue to work um, in your favor. And um, and I guess, too, what I'm more curious about is, is that if I'm, I'm going to run into an issue where I, you know, on some of my baby green trays or my microgreen trays, are they going to end up in the clamshells? Yeah. And so that's going to be another aspect of, of managing uh, the ladybugs is making sure they're not making their way to the packaging. For sure. Yeah, that, that was always my biggest um, uh, concern with using beneficial insects for for an indoor grow is like, are they going to end up in the final product? Mm -hmm. especially with the really small insects that people may not see or like a mm -hmm. ladybug that would be like, you know, it would be pretty crunchy if you, if you, mm -hmm. if you chewed on it, you know, Yeah, I wanna <laughs> but do um, you know, I, 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 I think you're probably not going to have that many, like you're not, like, you know, some, you know, sometimes, in, I don't know if, if you experience this in Florida, but sometimes in the fall, there's just like a boom of ladybugs where, where I mm -hmm. am in Canada in the fall, just cause there's so many aphids and other mm -hmm. similar insects that they eat that they just explode in population. If you have something like that, then it probably would end up, you know, in some product. But um, I remember selling just, you know, outdoor greens uh, before I even started my microgreens farm and having customers come back and be like, I found a snail in in the in the bag. And I remember I was asking other farmers that were more experienced than me. And they're like, yeah, this is organic farming. Like sometimes yeah. there's insects. You gotta that wash end your up. produce. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so, you know, it's it's part of it, it. You know, it's a good if I were to find, you know, a ladybug in my hydroponic lettuce, I would say that's probably a good sign. That means they're not spraying anything because you exactly. can't spray pesticides when you have insects there. Yeah. I mean, as, as a farmer, I'd rather there be a ladybug in a clamshell than an aphid. Um, and as a consumer, I would also love to see a ladybug walking around my lettuce than, than knowing they're using some type of pesticide um, on that crop. So, so yeah. That, yeah, that, that, that's it right there. Yeah, for sure. I, 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 I totally agree. I think most people, if they knew what the, if they are educated on the health effects of pesticides, they would would rather eat a ladybug by accident than exactly. consistently eat like you know pretty much a, a poison in in some capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I I love to uh, to kind of understand kind of what your personal favorite microgreen edible flower is to to use and how you use it at home. Mm. Uh, let's see. So probably my personal favorite to eat is our leeks. So we grow the American flag leeks and uh, definitely by far, um, putting them on pizza, really on anything breakfast related. I'll put leeks on everything. Um, arugula is actually another favorite of mine. It's a pretty, pretty common one, but I just, I love some good fresh arugula, um, especially on a burger and a sandwich or something like that. Um, and yeah, those are definitely probably my top two favorites, uh, to eat. And there was a second half. What was the second half of the question to eat and then to like what? how you use them, which I think. You yeah, can, yeah. 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 Everything man, and everything. And that's a, you know, people don't, you know, always really know how to use them, but I, I put them on everything, add them in sandwiches, you know, yeah. garnish my plates with them. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, those are, those are some of my favorite too. Yeah. Like leeks, onions, uh, garlic chives. They're all, they're so nice and tender and just, mm -hmm. oh, they're so good. And then, oh yeah, arugula is one of my, one of my favorite too. There's the, the pepperiness of the micro mm -hmm. arugula. Like I can literally eat it by the handful. It's, uh, yeah. it's so good. Yeah. yeah. I, actually, I think for I actually me having it. 
Yeah, I think for me, it's the the smell of it. It's that that the arugula smell, is that freshness, and and then yeah, when you bite into it and you get that nice peppery, it's it's nice. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, if, if if anyone hasn't tried, if they're if someone's listening, it's just like uh, you know new to microgreens. If you can go and buy some micro arugula, arugula at your local store, definitely try it. It's out mm-hmm. of this world compared to the mature you know arugula that you get in the clamshell. Yeah. Um, it's it's re- it's really intense, but in a, in a really good way if you like arugula. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, give, given that you're expanding the business, I'm, I'm interested in some of the challenges you may be experiencing or have experienced. Um, so, if if you had, if you became, uh, you know, you had some magical powers and you can wave a wand and instantly solve a business challenge that you're currently facing, what issue would you choose to resolve and and why? And I was thinking about this, and I knew this question was coming, and I, and I think. And this is where I give my, my middle brother, Julian, a lot of kudos and where he's helped us out the most with this. But it's really communicating effectively to all of our customers, um, particularly chefs. Um, they can sometimes be hard to communicate with. Um, they don't really like to answer emails. Um, they really predominantly all work via text message. And when we were in, in the middle of last year, which was one of our busiest years, um, Daniel was managing all of these messages, all these communications by phone. Um, and it was just, it was very challenging. There's leaving a lot of room for error, for confusion, for some mix ups for, Oh shoot, I talked to this guy and I forgot to put the order in or, you know, silly little mistakes that were, you know, just because of the scale of all these good problems that we were having, we were making some small mistakes that were ultimately, um, upsetting some of our chefs. And we even got some, some feedback saying, Hey guys, like, you know, you weren't communicating with me and, and, and whatever. And, um, and so the solution to that, and this is what Julian has really helped us incorporate into our businesses. And actually, this is also uh, from our buddy Kyle Wheeler at Ransom Farm. He, he, he kind of pointed us in this direction, but uh, starting to use Go High Level uh, for a CRM. And, what, and, and since we've talked with Kyle and, and incorporated into our business, um, it's been a, an amazing tool for communicating, uh, for doing mass communication. So it, it's a lot easier to send one message to everybody yeah. um, and they all receive it as a personal message, not like a mass email. Um, and we even have been able to set up automated response through text messaging. And we have our own text messaging uh, pl- platform now so that we are every week, a chef is getting a weekly reminder saying, hey, uh, this is Sunday, your, 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 your order's coming on Tuesday. Um, you know, now's your chance to make any changes if you need to. Um, and then even so, like we've got a, val- a holiday coming up, Valentine's Day. Um, this year, now that we have this CRM, we've actually been able to capture orders a month in advance. We've been able to get our flowers completely sold out and actually get a waiting list for any additional orders wow. if we are able to package more after that capacity, after that cap number. And, um, and because of the CRM, because we're able to communicate more effectively, um, this, this Valentine's day compared to last Valentine's day is almost doubled, um, what it was. Uh Um, and, and, and not only that last Valentine's day, I was pulling my hair out, getting all these orders in last minute, not knowing if I could even fill the orders. Um, whereas now I've had plenty of time to plant all the trays. I know I have all the product I'm going to need. I feel a lot more at peace (laughs) with the week. And my brothers are, are a lot happier with with uh, with the sales that we got from it. And so having this tool, a, a good communication tool to communicate effectively with the chefs um, has been amazing. Um, and the Go High Level and the CRM service that they offer has, has been able to do that for us. Um, so that was definitely, if I could do that when we started it, you know, it would have saved a lot of issue, a lot of headache, yeah. a lot of confusion. Um and uh, and also it just allows us to better prepare ourselves for these peaks in in sales. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that that's something that people don't often realize when as you expand. Um, I've experienced this myself as well, where the the the, the broken telephone of communication is much m- much more likely to happen the more customers you have. Because if you have like two hundred customers placing orders, it's not that hard to mix one up with another. Like it it, exactly. it can be pretty pretty easy, whether it's packing, invoicing, mm-hmm. uh, just, uh, initial communication on the order, like mm-hmm. all that stuff has more air, room for error, the more customers you have, because yeah. uh, it, it just starts getting more complex of a system you're creating. Um, and, and not not necessarily on purpose, but like 
you know, if you have more customers, there's more room for errors. It sounds like um, what's, what's smart about this is that you adapted, instead of having all the chefs have to change the way they communicated necessarily, you were able to find some, a solution that would adapt to their preferred method of communication, which was text messaging, but still automated on your end, um, which yep. is, which is really smart. Yeah. I've never heard of that. Um, and I didn't realize how, in like how, how common text message instead of email is for restaurant customers. Cause in my experience, we use uh, email mostly, but you, there are some customers that just as much as you tell them, Hey, we need email orders. Mm -hmm. They would still text you orders. Text and you, it, would, yeah. it would be great to have something like that in yeah. place so that it just, yeah. And, and then also between the three of you guys, it keeps communication more clear because you, I'm guessing you all have access to the software. Right. So we could, we could all, that's, what's nice is, is it'll create a, it'll funnel all of our communications, whether it's an email, a text message, um, an Instagram post or a DM on Instagram, it'll funnel everything into one, uh, one message chain. Mm. So like you could literally email a chef on Instagram, you'll see it pop up on the message and then you can send them an email. It'll come in as an email. You could shoot them a text message. You'll see the text message. So oh, you have great. one continuous thread uh, and multiple avenues to communicate. And so that you don't lose your place and forget what you last communicated with that person. Um, and then it also has functions to where you can do mass communication. So you can put together mass text messages, mass emails. Um, and, um, and, and, and another, another benefit. So like you were saying, you know, Daniel is, his job is to get as many orders in as we can. And so, you know, while he was doing all, all this over the phone, we would be in the middle of harvesting. He's like, Hey guys, I got five more orders. And we're like, you're like, Oh man. And, and so it caused more <laughs> confusion and frustration for us. Yeah. And you know, when, when we're harvesting, I, I'm a very, you know, this is the pick list and that's all that's getting harvested and packaged and anything outside of that is not correct. And so it was, uh, it was very, it can be frustrating and, and complicated when, when you have all these additional things going on throughout the day. Um, and, uh, and so, so yeah, so, um, lost where I was going with that, but, but to the point, just having that, oh yeah. So having this communication system now, we are now being proactive. We are playing the chef's game by using text messaging. Um, we are being proactive by over communicating. And now when a chef calls us last minute, we're like, sorry, chef, we now have an order cut off. We communicated with you and we're no longer take your order because you're past the order cut off. Yeah. And so that has, that essentially has completely eliminated these last minute orders throughout the day, um, which has made our lives a lot simpler, a lot more streamlined. When we come in to start harvesting in the morning, we know what to expect. We get it done and we're out of there. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, before we take on every little order we could to try to maximize our, our production and, and uh, which is great, but is also a lot, you know, it can yeah, be exhausting, no, so. for sure. This, this sounds like a great, uh, software for anyone that's selling, especially anyone that's selling to chefs, because I, I totally agree where they're, they're, the main thing is they're just busy, right? Like they don't want to yeah. start typing up an email. Like it's not yeah. intentional that they're like, we only want to use text message or, or, or whatever. But I, I've experienced where like chefs are just really busy. Like they got a mm -hmm. lot of stuff that going on. They just want to like send you a message, get the order, not have to think about it anymore. So it's great exactly. that you have a, a solution for that. Um, and this, this, com this really comes down to, um, building a business that works for, for you and your brothers. Right. Cause like mm -hmm. you could have kept going the same way and just like burnt out on dealing with like all these last minute orders and stuff. And you, it's your business. So you can choose to have that order cut off and you can choose mm -hmm. to use the software that will make it a lot easier to communicate, make sure the chefs are happy with everything that's, that's happening and make it easier for you guys. So it's like a win-win in, in every, in everyone's books. And I'm sure mm -hmm. like it's well worth the, the price of whatever yeah. the SaaS service is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It is. So yeah, go uh, high level. Definitely look it up if 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 you're wanting to incorporate some technology into your farm or your business in general. Um, and the, and the, the the software has tons of other f functions and features outside of the, the text messaging that that we've yet to dig into. But uh, but yeah, it's it's been a huge game changer for us. Awesome, awesome. Uh, we'll start wrapping up soon. But I'd, I'd love to hear if you can go back in time to when you started your farm in 2020 and meet the younger version of Jordan. What advice would you give him to set him up for success in the business? And again, this is this is somewhat unique to myself, but I, I came from a, a pretty structured, you know, corporate business uh, in, in the cannabis industry. Um, the, the the company I was working for was was one of the first in, in Florida to get their license and quickly became one of the largest. And so, um, I I 
I learned a very corporate framework on how to manage, how to do things, how to communicate. And what I found starting my own small business is a lot of that does not apply and that you should really be more flexible. Um, you should really learn to, you know, I would, I was of the opinion that, you know, we were going to offer it this way and this is how we were going to communicate to the chefs and that's just how they were going to get it. And, and what we were learning was that, well, the chefs need to be communicated this way and we need to adapt to them. And, um, and, and I used to be a lot more rigid in that sense and uh, coming from that corporate background. And, and over the years I've learned to really, you know, let go of some of that and be a little bit more fluid, be a little bit more open to different ideas, different concepts. Um, and, um, and know that, that in business, you know, anything goes, everything is on the table. All options are a possibility and it's really up to us to weigh and determine what we want to do with our time and our effort. And, um, but, but, you know, you'd be surprised any single day, you know, any, any day somebody can pick up the phone call you guys with a new opportunity, something exciting. And, uh, and so being open to, cause they actually happen. They, they do have a lot of people think like, how do we get these opportunities to do all these great things? And, and people actually reach out, you know, if you set yourself up, put yourself in the place to receive these opportunities, the opportunities will present themselves. Yeah. That, that's really great. I think that's really good advice, um, to your younger self and to others. I didn't have as much working experience starting my farm, but I, I did come in with a more rigid mindset when I started the business. And then the more, the more you are an entrepreneur, the more time you're an entrepreneur, I find that naturally the more open-minded you become, because you see that the world is not kind of what they taught you. It's something very different. And the opportunities uh, are really determined by your perspective. So if you're, if you're closed minded, then your opportunities will be very narrow because you're going to say low, no, no to a lot of things, or you won't even be open to hear it. Whereas the more you're, you, you, you are able to open your mind and see, okay, there's so many ways to sell microgreens. There's so many ways to run this business. There's so many ways to hire staff or to collaborate. Then that's when really the opportunities up, start appearing because you're opening up to what is possible. And it's, yeah, some, sometimes I, I think about these like universal laws um, that I try, I'm, I'm still trying to learn about them and understand them, but I've noticed in business, a lot of them pop up where, uh, you know, the, you, you attract a certain type of people to your business based on how you are. So as you change, you'll attract different people to the business as customers, as, um, as employees, as business partners, potentially. Um, and there's all these sorts of universal laws that I've seen happen in business and uh, being open-minded leads to more opportunity is, is one of those that I've kind of witnessed over, over the 10 years of, of farming and running the business. That, that's, that really speaks on it is, it's just being open and, and ready for anything. Cause the opportunities do present themselves and, and, uh, just be ready to jump at them when they do. Awesome. Yeah. I think, I think this is great, Jordan. I, thank you so much for coming on. This was such a good episode with so much information. Um, if listeners want to connect with you or learn more about the consulting you do or your farm, where can they find you online and on social media? Yeah, absolutely. No. And again, I, I really enjoyed our talk today. Thanks for having me, Jonah. Um, and yeah, anyone who's, who's interested in reaching out or connecting with us, you can find us at legacygreens3.com. Um, all of our social medias, Instagram, uh, Facebook is also legacy greens with an S the number three. Um, and we are offering edible flower consulting. Uh, it's essentially a, a three month program and it's not necessarily specific to edible flowers, but we can also talk about microgreens. We can talk about automated irrigation, um, any indoor farming things you kind of want to learn more about us from, we can discuss during that program. And um, we're, we're really excited to offer it. And, and, and specifically the, my, the edible flower portion of it, I think is, is pretty unique. And I've had a lot of people reach out to us asking about questions and, and if we offer it. And so we do, it's a, it's a three month program and I'll pretty much walk you through the whole process of growing edible flowers on your own and how to be really good at it. So. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. If anyone's interested, definitely check that out again. Thanks so much Jordan, for coming on. This was great. Thanks for tuning in to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your Microgreens business, visit microgreensconsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of Microgreens businesses, and you're invited to join the success story. 
Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Mike Greens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share Mike Green's magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.